John chapter 9, looking at a message this morning entitled, Without Excuse. Have you ever faced the consequences of something you did because you just wouldn't listen? Every time you got disciplined, perhaps, as a child, or should have been disciplined, maybe. Um, there are many times that I could think of that, and I want to share with you. I've shared some stories before, but you don't need to keep hearing about my faults and failures. You can think about your own. Um, but we, we have faced the consequences when we decide to go against what we've been told. Sometimes that can just lead to temporary discipline. Sometimes that could be fatal. Uh, there's a story of an old man named Harry Truman, not, not talking about the late president, uh, who was the last holdout on Mount St. Helens. You remember that? Many, some of you were alive then. Um, those who were are going to hate to hear that I was not. Uh, I was seven years away from, from coming into this wonderful world. But on May 18th of 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, and it was an eruption that, that virtually shook the globe. And, and there was ash all over the place and, and uh, created tremendous turmoil. There were warnings. People who studied that mountain studied the tectonic shifts and all the, the irritation that was happening there underground. They were warning those who lived around Mount St. Helens, you need to get away from this place. This thing is going to erupt. We don't know exactly when, but it's coming. There, every sign is pointing to this mountain blowing up, and it's not going to be good. Well, there was a man named Harry Truman that was a longtime owner of a resort on Spirit Lake that was in the shadow of Mount St. Helens. And at 83, he refused to evacuate despite urgent warnings of imminent disaster. He was interviewed by local media in March of 1980, less than two months before the eruption, and he vowed that he would never leave his home and business, and he said, the mountain will never hurt me. Truman's occasionally profane pronouncements made for good copy, and soon the national media was landing helicopters in his front yard for interviews. He became somewhat of a stubborn celebrity. No outsiders were present when the mountain finally blew up on a quiet Sunday morning, but Truman, defiant to the end, was buried alive. And his legend lives on. <clears throat> Truman was a made-for-prime-time folk hero, it is said. He was the proverbial farmer sitting on his front porch, cradling a shotgun and refusing to move when bulldozers showed up to build a freeway. Mr. Truman illustrates the same tragic reality that we see of the Pharisees in John chapter 9, and really throughout the Gospel of John. We're, we're very familiar with the Pharisees and their stubbornness and their rejection. When they were confronted with the truth and presented with the way to escape impending doom, they stubbornly held on, and they paid the price. Today we finish up chapter 9. We, we looked at a bulky section last week, largely narrative, so easy to just hit the whole thing. Today, hitting the last three verses of this chapter, and I'd like us first to consider the justification of the blind. Let's read verses 39 through 41. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that they which see might not see, and, they which, uh, and that, that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees, which were with him, heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. The justification of the blind. What is Jesus saying here? Well, he was just in the, in the prior narrative, if you've missed the messages or just forgot what I've said over the last couple of weeks, um, he was dealing with a man who was born blind, and there was some concern about whether this man had sinned and then caused his blindness, or whether his, his parents had sinned, and God was judging him because of his parents' sin. And in this case, Jesus said this illness, this blindness, was not caused as a direct result of his or his parents' sin. Now, we know that every ailment, every sickness, every injury, all the violence that we see around us today is a result of original sin. Because of Adam's sin, we have all of the destruction, all of the wickedness made by personal choices. We have all the sicknesses, all the, the struggles because of sin. There are times when a person's personal sin can lead to physical difficulties, can lead to physical troubles, sicknesses. In this case, that was not, not true. Jesus said it was not, not, he was not born this way because of his sin or his parents' sin, but that God's works could be seen. 
in him, that, that God could use him tremendously, and he did. We saw that this blind man, because of his willingness to accept what Jesus said, to after he, Jesus spit on the, the ground and he, he made a mixture of mud and he, he rubbed it on the man's eyes, he told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, that blind man listened. He did exactly what Jesus said to receive sight. I pointed out the fact that there's a, a wonderful picture of salvation in that. A person cannot get saved doing their own thing. A person cannot get saved just listening to somebody else's ideas or trying out his best ideas. A person gets saved by going the way that God has said. Jesus said, I am the way, this is John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This man chose to go the way Jesus said to go. He received physical healing. He was cast out because of his <clears throat> insistence that that this man was the Christ, and he, throughout his testimony, talks about him being a prophet and eventually acknowledging that he was the, the Christ. And the Pharisees, who had had enough of Jesus, had, had made it known that anybody who professed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, they'd be kicked out of the synagogue. There would be religious and political consequences for, for acknowledging your Savior. Our world today is full of religious and political consequences for people who accept and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior. And that has caused a lot of Christians just to zip the lips and keep our faith to ourselves and to hide it under a bushel. Well, you know how that song goes, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. We need to let our light shine because people need to see Christ. They don't need to see a bunch of muted Christians. They need to see Christians who are reflecting and representing their Savior. This blind man did that. And what ultimately led to his restoration, and all of this has a point, what, what ultimately led to his healing and then his eventual salvation is that he was willing to acknowledge there is something wrong with me. And this man can help me. And so he was justified. And, and he, in order to be justified, a person has to acknowledge their own sinfulness. He was willing to do that. As we'll see in the next point, the Pharisees would routinely refuse to acknowledge that they had a problem. And Jesus would say that he came into the world... Um, not to say the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. See, the sick are the ones that need the physician. And when you're sick, when you realize there's something wrong with you, you go to a doctor. Now, you, you may be of the persuasion that I'm just not going to go, I'm going to tough this out, and maybe you're tough, and maybe you could do that, and maybe you need to go to the doctor, or maybe you go and you didn't need to go. Um, wherever you are on the spectrum, figure that out, I guess. But <clears throat> when you have something seriously wrong with you, you're not going to get any help or find any healing if you don't acknowledge that there is a problem. If your, your heart's constantly causing pain and you're constantly sick in some way, it's not going to just get better. You've got to figure out what's wrong. And to have that happen, you have to acknowledge, I've got a problem. I can't do it on my own. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and all this over-the-counter stuff isn't touching whatever this is. It's bothering me. I need to go to the person who has the expertise, has the ability to help me. God has given us people, doctors, nurses, that that have knowledge and skill to give us certain things. Ultimately, we accept the Lord's help and we seek Him. But in order to have justification, this person needed to acknowledge his own sinfulness. If you'll hold your place here in John chapter 9, go over just a couple chapters to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 46. <clears throat> I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. As you know, I love that word, whosoever. Uh, we've seen in Revelation there is a time that I can't stand the word whosoever. It hurts to read it. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You don't believe in the Lord. You hold on to your own way. You'll face the consequences. That will be eternal judgment. And whoever, anyone who does not accept Jesus, tries to do it their own way, will be cast into into that lake of fire. You can't get to heaven by being a good person, by just coming to church. You have to follow what Jesus said. And so he came as a light. John reveals that, reveals Jesus saying that many times in his gospel. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. This world is full of people who just really love their darkness, who just insist on staying where they are. They're fine the way they are. Have you ever talked with somebody about the Lord? And they may not be belligerent, they may not be nasty about it, but they'll say, you know what, I, I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm glad that you believe that, I'm fine. Has that ever happened? Have you ever had any discussions like that? People believe 
I don't need help. I'm fine the way that I am. I haven't done anything, and this is where the comparison game gets dangerous. I haven't done this, this, or this, therefore I'm okay. And God must be happy with me because I'm not in jail for murder or any of these other really bad things. In order to receive justification, in order to get help, there needs to be an acknowledgement of sinfulness. And there needs to be an acceptance of the Savior. Just as his acknowledgement of his own blindness allowed for him to be ultimately healed, the blind man was saved when he accepted Jesus as his Savior. And as we saw last week when we studied the previous verses, he simply chose to believe what Jesus said. He took him at his word. Look back in John chapter 9. After he had been cast out of the synagogue, Jesus came to him. Verse 35 says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He, being the blind man, answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped it. He worshipped him. I know we're not studying that section, but just in, in these verses, you see the wonderful grace of Jesus. How he came to this man. And we know from Luke 19.10 that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to this man. He didn't wait for this man to find his way to Jesus. Now that he was able to see, he could, find, he could see where he was going. He didn't need help. He didn't need, I don't know if they used sticks to, to tap the ground ahead of them to sense where they are. I, I imagine they probably just had people leading them. He didn't need that anymore. He could see where he was going. Jesus didn't just wait for him to figure it out, to look him up online and find out his address and, and Google him and go find where Jesus lived. Jesus came to him. He brought salvation to him. Jesus has come today. If you don't know the Lord is your Savior, He's come today with the gift of salvation for you. Such is the grace of Jesus. And this man, acknowledging his own problem, acknowledging his sin, was able to then accept Jesus as his Savior. He took Jesus at His word. Jesus simply told him, I'm the Messiah. I'm your Savior. And he said, okay, I believe. Very likely, this man had heard that the Messiah would heal, that the Messiah would do signs and wonders. John presents many of those in his Gospel. And so he knew that the Messiah was capable of doing these things. He acknowledged to the Pharisees in the previous section that only a man of God could do these things. The Pharisees were stuck on this, this false belief that Jesus had a demon and he was of the devil. Well, obviously a devil's not going to cast out the devil. A house divided will not stand. And so he acknowledged this man has to have come from God. He cannot be a sinner. A sinner could not do these things. Somebody who is away from God or has nothing to do with God could not do the works of God. And so once he puts all these pieces together, Jesus simply comes to him and says, I am he. And he says, all right, I believe. The Pharisees, it is, it is heartbreaking and it is frustrating to see the Pharisees how time after time after time, the people who knew God's word the best, the people who had the most exposure to it, the people who should have at first sight looked at Jesus and said, obviously, this is the one. They were the ones saying no. They were the ones rejecting him. But this blind man put the pieces together and he accepts Jesus as his Savior. Hold your place and go to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. There has to be a change in a person's heart. In Ephesians, I don't have this on the, the notes here <coughs> on, on the screen, but you can turn back at just a couple pages to Ephesians chapter 2. You hath he quickened, this is verse 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible goes on in the next couple verses to talk about how sinful people are, and that was all of us. Lest we think that we were the exception, that we were okay, that we didn't have any problems. If you're here without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are not without problems. And God will never look on you in your current state and say, you have done it. You are enough. This world will tell you, you're enough. Affirm yourself. God tells you, Jesus is enough. Believe in Him. 
In verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. Together with Christ, He did a work in our heart to awaken us to our need that we, have, we need a Savior. Because otherwise, Romans says that no man seeketh after God. On our own, we weren't interested in finding Jesus. We may have wanted something, but we weren't looking for Him until He did that quickening work and, and woke us up and helped us to see, I need to make a decision right now. And maybe God's using His Word today to help you understand, I need to make a decision for Christ. I'm at a, I'm at a decision point. I'm at the fork in the road. And I'm either going to keep going my own way, or I'm going to go the way that God would have for me to go. I'm going to go His way. That's the only way that leads to heaven. This man did not go his own way, and he certainly didn't go the way of the Pharisees. He went God's way. He accepted Jesus as his Savior. And the blind man, because of his acknowledgement of his own issues, his own sinfulness, was able to receive salvation and justification. But next, we see the judgment of the blind. The judgment of the blind. Go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. And verses 40 and 41, And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye would have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. There are two things that we're going to see that sin does. It blinds and it binds and, and it creates pride. And so let's look at the blinding of pride. What were, the, what were the Pharisees really asking when they said, are we blind also? They were basically asking an accusatory question of Jesus. What? Do you think we have something wrong with us? Look back in verse 34. They had the same attitude with the man who was born blind who is now healed and is telling them the truth about what God's Word says. He was instructing the instructors. He was teaching the teachers about what God's Word really said. He understood truth. His mind was beginning to be awakened by that truth. Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. And it was setting this man free. Well, in verse 34, these arrogant people, what do they say? They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? In other words, who do you think you are to teach us? We're the ones with the degrees. We're the ones that are the experts. We're the ones with the knowledge. You have no business telling us what the Bible says. Can I just say something? You're never at a point where you don't need someone to help you understand God's Word. No matter how long, how long you've been saved, how old you are, who you are, you still need to understand what God's Word says. I appreciate people in my life who, who help me to understand God's Word better. I need that, and I love that. This man was, was presenting the truth, and yet these blind Pharisees, because of their pride, they continued to resist it. They continued to reject their own spiritual condition. And through their, their spiritual blindness, they were both unable and unwilling to see their own sin. And I think often we, we fall into the latter category. Even though we're saved, we don't want to look at our problems. We don't want to look at where we're sinful. We don't like it when people say, hey, I've noticed this, especially, especially if it's our spouse. You never noticed it's hard to accept that, and I don't mean this as a joke. But when, when someone who loves you and knows you the best comes to you and in love, probably has spent time thinking about how do I present this so that you know, we don't need marital counseling after we have this discussion. But they come to you and say, look, I love you, but this is what I'm seeing. You have an accountability partner. Ladies, you have a, a sister in Christ who just comes to you and says, hey, I love you, but this is what I'm noticing in your life, and it's not right. Can I help you? Can I pray for you? Is there anything that you need? Men, you have an accountability partner or a brother in Christ who comes to you and notices something and says, hey, let's, let's get this right. Let's get this taken care of. Sometimes we reject that, and these Pharisees always rejected it. They, did, they didn't figure they had any problems. They didn't consider themselves sinners. In fact, you, you look back uh, before we go on to Proverbs. <clears throat> they, the, the very verse here, their own words incriminate them. They, they didn't see themselves as sinners. They tell this blind man, Thou wast altogether born in sins. What they refused to acknowledge was that so were they. <laughs> they were born sinners just as much as this blind man was. But they didn't consider that. They didn't think that. They didn't, they didn't see themselves as sinful. Let's go back to Proverbs 26. 
Proverbs 26, verse 12. <clears throat> Perfectly sums up these Pharisees. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Now, the Bible says that a fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. So there is more hope for a fool, using that biblical term, someone who is rejecting God's deity, than a man who is wise in his own conceits, a man who thinks that I've got it all together, I've got it figured out, I know the way that I need to go. These Pharisees definitely believed that. Their own spiritual knowledge puffed them up. And of course, puffed them up to the point that they even added to God's Word. Now we know from Revelation that you add to God's Word, you're going to receive the curses that are in this book. So don't dare do it. These Pharisees were constantly adding their own traditions and elevating them above Scripture. Jesus healed, and the, the passages point this out, Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath day. Verse 16 of John 9 says, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. In previous chapters, Jesus healed a man who was, who was lame, and he had an illness for 38 years, and he healed him on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees hated that, and they go after him, and he, he, is, he is blaspheming God, and he is hating God, and he is breaking God's law and not observing God's Sabbath. Well, if you look back over the law, God hadn't said that what Jesus did was wrong. It was the Pharisees and their tradition. Now, there were certain things that God told the Jews that he wanted them to do and to not do on the Sabbath day. But Jesus would point out, you'll, you'll be willing to circumcise a male child because the eighth day of his life, which required by the Jewish laws, when circumcision happened, if that eighth day fell on the Sabbath day, they would circumcise him because they wanted to observe the law. They wanted to hang on to that law. But heaven forbid Jesus heal a man's whole body on the Sabbath day. And you see the double standard, the hypocrisy. And they have the same hypocrisy when it comes to the, the man who was born blind telling them the truth about Jesus. Thou was altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And then Jesus says for, in verse 39, For judgment I came into this world, that they which see might not see, and that they which see might be made blind. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying that people who think that they've got it together, people who think that I don't have any problems, I am perfectly whole, Hence the example of seeing. They don't, they don't recognize their own problem. They don't acknowledge that they have anything wrong. But this blind man, he acknowledged. In fact, in verse 41, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye would have no sin. In other words, if you acknowledged that you had a problem, you'd be fine. You'd get your sin taken care of like this man did. The man who was born blind acknowledged his blindness. He got that taken care of. He acknowledged his spiritual need. He got that taken care of. But these people here, these Pharisees, who thought that they had it all together, they, they didn't get their sin dealt with. They didn't get their heart right with God. They were lost. And what does Jesus say? He'll, he'll tell them that their pride is going to bind them. He says, <clears throat> in verse 41, If ye were blind... In other words, if you acknowledged you had a problem, you would have no sin because you'd get it taken care of, in other words. But now ye say, we see. In other words, we're fine. We got no problems. We're okay. Therefore, because of this, your sin remaineth. Because of who they were and the fact that they refused to acknowledge their own spiritual needs, the Pharisees were bound in their pride. They held on to their self-righteousness to the bitter end, to the point that Jesus said, your sin remaineth. And we see that happening in our society today. We see that happening in our nation today. Um, a passage that I've mentioned a lot lately, Romans chapter 1. You go ahead and turn there. We were looking at that a little bit on Wednesday night. Romans chapter 1. And the, the screen should say, and I apologize that it doesn't, uh, verses 21 through 25. It was... Uh, typing this up at the hospital on a couple hours of sleep, so um, I'm surprised I don't have more misspellings than I do. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, because that when they knew God, this verse, these verses could very easily describe the Pharisees, very easily describes people today. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. 
Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. In other words, they, they exchanged, they switched truth for a lie, and they started believing a lie rather than the truth. And worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We'll go on to chapter 2 in just a minute, but we see in these verses a perfect description. As I mentioned of the Pharisees, we see a description of many people in our world today refusing to acknowledge God, refusing to acknowledge the truth, and hanging on rather to themselves, hanging on to a God of their own making, ultimately hanging on to worshiping themselves. They're not interested in God's authority, which is why they reject Him, which is why when they knew God, verse 21, they glorified Him not as God. They don't want God's authority. If For someone to acknowledge that there is a God means that they have to acknowledge that He is in control. He has the authority, complete, ultimate, universal authority. They're not willing to do that. And on Wednesday we talked about, or maybe it was a couple of Wednesdays ago, talked about how people will believe an evolutionary mindset and they'll believe all these things that there is no God and that everything that you see just happened randomly. Everything just created itself. There's a big bang and everything just went into existence and out of chaos. We have order. We have, we have very clear, meticulous order that randomly happened. Has anybody ever here had their house just randomly clean itself? Have your kids' rooms randomly cleaned themselves? I'll testify that mine haven't. If you find a house that does that, I'll pay whatever it costs to get that house. It doesn't exist. Order does not come from chaos unless somebody does something about it. Everything that we see has such unique order. With my daughter having just been born, they, we, we see she, it's just such a tiny little thing. She was seven pounds when she was born, and, and of course babies lose a little bit of that shortly after they're born, and it takes a little bit for them to gain that weight. But inside that body, which was fearfully and wonderfully made, is a, a fully functioning human body, fully functioning systems. They did different tests to make sure that this was working and that that was working, and, and they were, and things were working, and she's fine. And God did that. Chaos didn't do that. Evolution didn't do that. God did that. But people don't want God, and so we have to get creative and spin a tail that makes sense out of everything that we see. And that's these Pharisees weren't interested in acknowledging the truth. They wanted to profess themselves to be wise. And when they did that, instead of accepting the wisdom of God, which we find in His Word, when you profess yourself to be wise, you become foolish. Now, God may have given you some, some common sense. That doesn't mean you're wise. God may have given you a smart mind. That doesn't mean you're wise. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Wisdom is applying knowledge in a biblical way. Taking what God's Word says and living it out God's way. That's wisdom. You find wisdom here. You don't find it in your own mind. You don't find it elsewhere. You find it in God's Word. These people weren't interested in taking God at His Word. The Pharisees routinely added to it because they thought that what they had to say was much better and more thorough and, and binding than what God had said. You're still in Romans, hopefully. Go to chapter 2. We'll look at verses 11 and 12. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. You reject Christ, you're going to face the judgment. It doesn't matter who you are. These Pharisees believed they were above that. They believed that they were right. If anybody was going to get into heaven, it was them. They were convinced of that. And yet, they would not do what God said to do. They would not follow His Son. They would not accept Him. And their pride bound them. And because of that, Jesus said, Therefore your sin remaineth. Where are you at today, spiritually? Where are you at? What are you doing with what God has said? What are you doing with Jesus Christ? I hope you're saved. But as, as Brother Cliff mentioned in Sunday school, I can't look inside your hearts. Folks are dressed up, ready for church. That's great. I'm glad. That doesn't tell me that you're saved. It tells me you know how to put clothes on. It tells me you know how to get dressed. Look nice for church. That's good. It's a good thing to do. 
But that doesn't tell me anything about the inside. Lost people get dressed up all the time. Lost people get dressed up and they go to work. Lost people get dressed up, they go to parties. Lost people get dressed up, they go to weddings and funerals and all these things. So putting on clothes does not mean you're spiritual. It doesn't mean you're saved. You've come to church. That's phenomenal. You need God's word. You need to be around Christians. The Bible says forsake not the assembling of yourselves, ourselves together. We need to be here as often as we can be here. We need the accountability. We need the fellowship. We need the guidance from God's word. But coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. As I've said before, I know it's a silly illustration, but walking into your garage, if you have one, doesn't transform you into a car or all the clutter that you have in your garage instead of a car. A lot of people have garages for extra storage and their cars are all outside. You don't become your car or your junk when you go into the garage. You're still you. Coming to church, you're still you. Coming to church doesn't change your heart. Personal faith in Jesus Christ Accepting Him by what He has said changes your heart. Acknowledging that you've got a problem changes your heart. Accepting Jesus and going His way changes your heart. But it's possible you come to church and you can be just like the Pharisees. It's possible to have all the knowledge. You've grown up in church, perhaps. Many of us have that story. We've grown up in church. You grew up learning Bible verses. You might know more Bible verses than I do. You might know more Bible verses than most other people in the room. Memory does not equal salvation, folks. I got saved at the age of 14. And I had learned a lot of Bible verses in the first 14 years of my life. I wasn't saved because I hadn't believed in Jesus Christ. My memory worked, thankfully. And, and I'm hoping that it continues to do so. Don't ask me to quote anything today, though. I'm just going to say my mind is stretched and tired. But learning verses... Showing up to church, putting on church clothes, doesn't mean you're saved. Now, the Pharisees put all of their stock in the external. They dressed up well, and they had their verses in, in something called phylacteries. They had little compartments on their forehead and on their arms that, that had little scrolls wrapped up and put inside of it. And so they always had God's Word. They were carrying it around with them, and, and they were the spiritual ones. And, and in fact, you had the Pharisee, and you had, you had a tax collector. They were praying that one day, and the Pharisee said, I thank God that I'm not as this man. I'm not a sinner, in other words. Why did he come to that conclusion? Because I look good. I'm going through the motions. I'm doing what God said to do in this case. But anybody can do something. Anybody can act. Anybody can go through motions. If there's no relationship with Jesus Christ, all of that means nothing. Cliff was talking about becoming, you know, being the bride of Christ, being a Christian and that doesn't happen just by doing things. And, and when we talk about serving the Lord, and whether it's doing things here in the church, serving the Lord here, serving the Lord with your families, intentionally investing in the work of the Lord, none of that saves a person, and, and we don't encourage it so that you can work your way into God's favor. But the Bible says that there is fruit. There is evidence of a person's walk with Christ. And that is as we do things for Him, as we serve Him. That shows that we love the Lord. That shows that we, we have a relationship with Him when, when certain characteristics are part of who we are. So what's in your heart this morning? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I don't take, I don't take for granted or assume that everybody who comes to church is saved. And so that's why you hear me preach like this a lot because I was unsaved for 14 years growing up in an independent Baptist church. And I was a lost, independent Baptist teenager who listened well, who took notes, who learned the verses, who showed up and did all the things that a Christian person should do. None of it saved me because I did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you're tired of me preaching like this, find another church. But I'm going to keep preaching like this because the gospel needs to be presented. And folks, we all need the gospel. Whether you're saved or unsaved, we all need the gospel. We all need God's grace every single day. So whether you're a Christian or not, you need to have an honest biblical understanding of sin. When God confronts you about sin, whether through your personal Bible reading or through the teaching and preaching of His Word, how do you respond? How do you respond when you're convicted? How do you respond when God, either through a preacher, through a teacher, through your own time in God's Word, shows you you're wrong? You've been doing this and, and you thought it was okay and then you come to the Bible and God's Word says, oh, that's wrong. And He takes that spotlight and he shines it right into your heart. Right at that sin that has been hiding. Maybe you've been hiding it on purpose and maybe you didn't realize that it was there. 
and God reveals it to you, this is wrong, now is your chance to respond. What do you do when God corrects you? On Wednesday night, we talked about the conscientious mind, and it's possible to tolerate sin so much that it sears your conscience that you no longer think about sin's presence. It becomes such a normal part of your life that you don't even notice it. You believe that you're okay just the way that you are, but be careful, because that mindset reveals darkness in your heart and not light. Go back to 1 John, so the epistle of 1 John. Cliff mentioned verse 8 in chapter 1 this morning. We'll read several verses here that show an exchange and really show the ultimate way in which someone must respond when confronted with the truth of the gospel, whether, again, you're unsaved or whether you're saved. People respond in these ways. <clears throat> Look in verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, so far we've seen some wrong ways to respond to conviction. By saying, I'm okay, but your life doesn't show that you're okay. The light your life shows that you're walking wickedly. Now you might be saved, but you're making sinful choices. You're tolerating sin in your life when you ought to be expelling it, casting it away from you. That term casting, the Bible used that. It doesn't just mean to lightly toss it close enough that you can reach again. It means to throw that thing as far away as you can. Like you've got a live grenade and you don't want to get blown up by it. You don't just drop it next to you and hope that you'll be okay. You take that grenade and you throw it as far as you can. I don't know how many of you have held live grenades. I have not. Um, so I'm speaking from what I've seen of others or what I've been told. But it's, in general, common knowledge that you don't hold on to a live grenade or just drop it close by so you can pick it up if, if, in case you want it again. It's not going to be there for too long. And if you keep it close to you, you're not either. So you cast that grenade as far as you can. But this person in verse 6, oh, I, I'm fine, I have fellowship with God, and yet they're walking in darkness, they're lying. They're not doing the truth. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, so at that point... You're, you're refusing to acknowledge that what's in your heart is actually a problem. Even though God's Word has clearly said, this is sin. You say, I'm fine. It's okay. I have an exception. I have the get-out-of-jail-free card. I can do what I want. This is an issue of liberty when it's really not. We throw in spiritual liberty uh, in places that it's not a matter of liberty and say that I, I can do this even though God said that it's wrong. We, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we, we can't respond one of those two ways. And if you're responding one of those two ways today, get your heart right. Respond to what God's Word says and do what verse 9 says. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I love drawing out a couple words here in this verse. He is faithful, which means that every time sin is confessed, He will always forgive it. He will always do that cleansing work. And he is just, which means he has the right, because ultimately our sin is against God. And so when someone has been sinned against, they're the one that grants forgiveness. Jesus, God, has, has received the, the focus of our sin. We have aimed it at him, and he is just. He has the right to forgive us, completely forgive us from our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And verse 10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his, his word is not in us. So according to God's word, we, we've just read a few verses, I've talked a little bit about them, I'm not going to continue preaching on them, but according to God's word, are you walking in darkness or light right now? It, it really doesn't matter what you think about yourself, it doesn't. Now I love you, but it doesn't matter what you think about yourself. God judges by his standards, not by yours. He'll hold you accountable for his standards, not yours. You're not the authority you don't get to choose what's right and what's wrong. God has already declared it plainly in his word. What does God's word say about you today? Are you blind to your own sinfulness? Do you believe that you're just fine the way that you are and that God is sure to accept you because of that? That belief will not earn you eternal life but judgment. 
And if that is your case, you're not believing what God said, you're trying to do it on your own, then what Jesus said of the Pharisees will be said of you. Therefore, your sin remaineth. Your sin isn't taken away, it's still with you. You'll be held responsible for your sin if you continue to try to go your own way. If you continue to refuse to accept what Jesus has said, accept Him by faith, accept that He paid the full price of your sins by dying on the cross. Upon your death, Will you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. Right now, as Jesus said, if you're without him, your sin remaineth. So will you believe in him today? Christians, don't make the mistake of thinking that you can just live how you want because you're saved. That God now, because you're saved, is going to just give you an excuse, give you a hall pass to go and do what you want. Go to Romans chapter 6, and with this we'll close. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? There's a belief of some, and, and, Paul, and Paul even talks about this in Romans chapter 5. There's a belief of some that since I'm saved and since God can give enough grace to overcome the effects of our sin that in order to get more grace, I just need to sin more, and I have the license to do so. And he says in a very strong rejection, objection to that, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Christian, how you live matters. How you follow God's truth matters. God holds us accountable for our obedience to his word. So are you... Are you a good testimony of somebody who follows God? Are you a good testimony of somebody who does what he says? Or are you a terrible testimony of somebody who, they say, I say I'm saved, but I'm going to say what I want, do what I want, see what I want, go where I want. Whether I'm with God's people or not, I don't care. Other things are more important. How you follow Christ matters. And it has an impact on those who are around you. Parents, your children are watching you and they're learning to prioritize what you prioritize. They're learning to love the way they see love demonstrated. They're learning to love God by seeing how you love God. So let's not have it said, like was said in Judges, that there arose a generation that knew not the Lord. And we know how that happened. It happened because there were parents who didn't love the Lord like they needed to, didn't prioritize the Lord, and so their children, who were certainly not going to achieve the same level as their parents, they, children, we understand, you have to really push them, uh, because what they see in you, they'll, they'll maybe go a few steps down. I believe that generation that arose and knew not the Lord, they saw parents who looked at God as optional. They didn't take him seriously. They didn't take his word seriously. Christians, we need to take God seriously. And as was the case with old, <clears throat> and you go look at his name again, old Harry Truman. He was warned about Mount St. Helens exploding and he didn't do anything about it. As was the case with these Pharisees who were warned that their sin would lead them to eternal destruction. God's word has warnings for us. We need to live right. And if you're not saved, the warning, I said I was going to close with the other passage, but God just gave me another verse to to say to you in Revelation you don't need to turn there I'll just quote these or read these verses this is Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15 death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire that is a warning that if you receive if you refuse to accept Jesus Christ that is your fate and there's no do-overs and so on, on the day of judgment, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, there will be no excuse. You'll not be able to say, well, God, I just didn't know. If you're here today, you've heard the gospel. There is no excuse for you. You've read the Bible. There is no excuse for you. You don't have a relationship with the Lord. Get that taken care of. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today, and thou shalt be saved. In a moment, we'll have an invitation. Some music will be playing over the speakers. And if you need some help, I'd love to help you. It can be a hard thing, it can be a challenging thing to acknowledge that I have a problem. 
Eyes will be closed, heads will be bowed, people aren't going to be looking around. But ultimately, this is between you and God. If you have a decision that you need to make for the Lord, make it. Make it today. Christian, if there's sin in your life, if God has shown that light into your heart today, get that taken care of. Don't leave this place continuing to hang on to that sin. Get get rid of it. You can come and pray here. You can pray at your seats, but do something. Confess your sins, and he will be faithful and just to forgive you your sins. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you use your word so powerfully. I thank you that it is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished to all good works. Your word gives us everything that we need to know what right and wrong is, to be able to know who you are and what you expect, to know how we can get right when there is sin in our hearts and how we can stay right once we've gotten right. Lord, your word is perfect. It is complete. Help us to completely trust it. Help us to completely follow. Help us to completely go the way that you would have us to go. If there's anybody here without Jesus Christ, up until this point, they have just been trying to get through life on their own. They've they've been trying to fabricate a spirituality that will please you, and nothing will ever achieve that except for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for someone, that they would put aside their pride and humbly accept that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is enough. And as Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. That somebody would find it finished for them today receive that gift of grace. For those of us who are saved, Lord, we need the gospel. We need your grace. We need that grace to help us to live right for you. We need that grace to uh, overcome weakness in our lives. We need that grace to see you through our struggles. We need that grace to help us overcome sin. So Lord, I pray you'd help us. If there's a believer in here today that has been toying with sin, not taking you seriously, not taking your word seriously, work in their heart and convict them. It's uncomfortable, but it's necessary to draw us back, and it's a sign that you love us. So please help us to get our hearts right. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please, with your heads bowed and eyes closed? We'll have some music playing over the speakers. If you need, if you need to uh, place your faith in Christ, you'd like to find some help, you'd like to find some verses that would help you, I'd encourage you uh, maybe to come, get my attention. We'll have somebody take you through God's Word. It's not about showing you what we think, not even giving you our churches doctrine. It's about showing you what the Bible says. That's where the authority is. We'd love to help you today. Christian, just take care of sin in your heart. Make sure that you're walking away from here focused on Christ and living for Him.